coming up on this episode of the Salesman Podcast. So you have to put a belief system in your soul that says, I'm going to do, I can do this, I'm capable of doing this, I believe in myself enough, I'm going to live it as though I were doing it, and that's going to come through much more self-confidently than somebody trying to boast their own, well, you know, I've spent three years in the Congo, and I've, you know, I don't, I was bitten by nine snakes, I don't care about that. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show, where we help you not just hit your sales targets, but really thrive in sales. If you haven't already, make sure that you click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Gittimer. You may know me as the author of The Little Red Book of Selling. On this episode, with the legend that is Jeffrey Gittimer, we're diving into the mindset of not just hitting your sales target. That's achievable for most people. The mindset, the attributes, the traits that you need to have and develop, the values that you need to bring into your life to have huge, incredible success, essentially to smash any goal you could possibly imagine over the next 10, 20 years. Let's jump right in. How much of our long-term success, so not necessarily closing a sale next week, but the five, 10 years of our career success, how much of this comes down to having the correct attitude and mindset to set us up for success? Uh, not much. I would say about 110%. <laughs> because if you don't have the right frame of mind, and I'm just going to put it in frame of mind, that's so much easier for people to understand. If you don't think of yourself as great, if you don't think of yourself as capable, if you don't think of yourself as a professional person who's able to change or persuade the other people to do what they want them to do, then you're not going to win long term. You may win short term by trying to hoodwink somebody, but long term, not even in the cards. And how much of this, I want to dive into the specific elements of all this in a second and you know, some of Napoleon, Napoleon Hill's thoughts on this, but how much of this comes down to well, I'm going to, I feel like I'm great. I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm going to have success in the end so I can feel it now. And how much of it comes down to truly believing that, you know, however, however you find the evidence to support it, I am great at perhaps this one thing, even if I suck at all this other stuff. I tell people to eliminate the phrase, fake it until you make it and substitute the phrase, live it in advance. So you have to put a belief system in your soul that says, I'm going to do, I can do this. I'm capable of doing this. I believe in myself enough. I'm going to live it as though I were doing it. And that's going to come through much more self-confidently than somebody trying to boast their own. Well, you know, I've spent three years in the Congo and I, you know, I don't, I was bitten by nine snakes. I don't care about that. <laughs> I care about. Where did that example come from, Jeffrey? I don't know. But, but I will tell you that I'm more concerned with as a, as a, a professional salesperson and the customer is more concerned with what are you going to do for me and how will that create some kind of a value that I can turn into money? That's what the customer is looking for, not a bunch of braggy bullshit. What does that look like practically? Because I, I want to move on to how we can instill some That's of okay. this into us in a what second. It looks like, what it looks like practically is, number one, building your own positivity, your own mindset, as it were, and then creating a series of value statements that the other person can link onto, feel good about, and want to buy from. Okay. So what is the difference between a jolly, positive person who walks into a room, who gives off this vibe of just, you know, I'm, I'm happy versus I'm someone... happy, I'm enthusiastic, great. And, and so is that what we're looking for? Or are we looking for a deeper level of all of this, which is I am, I'm positive because I know I'm going to bring you success? Well, let's talk about this book for just a moment. And let's talk, let's go towards the end of the book in a chapter that Hill calls the five point rule. And in this, Hill says, and this is a very important part of this book because it will give the reader an understanding of what he or she needs to do in order to capture the power inside this book. Success may be had by those who are willing to pay the price. And most of those who crave a $10,000 a year position, and keep in mind 100 years ago, that would be equivalent of about $250,000 today, or I think it's nine pounds. I'm not really sure how the conversion rate works. But especially if they are engaged in business, may realize it if they are willing to pay the price. And the price is eternal vigilance 
in the development of, and get these five things, self-confidence, enthusiasm, working with a chief aim, performing more service than you are paid for, and concentration. With these qualities well-developed, you will be sure to succeed. And let's name these qualities the five-point rule. What Hill is saying here is you have to combine them. You can't just be enthusiastic and have no self-confidence. You can't just be enthusiastic and not provide service. You, and you have to concentrate, which is in today's world is focus, on who you are, what you're doing, what your chief aim is, and how you intend to make it happen. And you prove yourself by providing more service than you're paid for. That's the only proof you've got. This is where I wanted to get into, Jeffrey. You, and, uh, clearly, I've, uh, I've rotated these down before, before the interview. So I want to go not necessarily through each of them, but I want to see how they tie together. And you kind of alluded to it there that we need all of them to have success. But in the context of sales here, we understand the the role of confidence and that confidence transfers. If you're nervous about talking about your product and you nervously talk about how it's going to help someone, clearly they're going to think you're full of bullshit and they're not going to believe you. And we can go through each one of these in, in that manner. But the one that stuck out to me, and this is something that I sometimes struggle with, with so I've run two businesses. There's this business and then there's a, a science business. And it's all about a media company about science, call it science science. We've talked about it on the show before. That I can talk about all day long. I get super excited about the sales side of things. I'm passionate about helping salespeople thrive in sales, not just hit the sales targets, but really have a great time when they're doing it and have a purpose for it. For me, that was always financial independence, to have enough money coming in from investments that my bills are covered and I feel secure and happy with my life. Uh, Then you can go, I feel then you can go and try and knock it out of the park with whatever whatever else you're doing. So that was always my chief aim of all of this and, and continues to be. But how does your chief aim interact with your sales job? Does it have to be directly related to, to business and finances? Or can you have a, another aim in life that you're using your sales job perhaps as a, as a vehicle to get there with? Is that appropriate as well? I don't think so. I think that if you develop a chief aim, it has to be focused around what you're doing 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week. Otherwise, both of those aims will be mediocrity, mediocrity and you're not going to get either one of them. You have to play ball in your own field, and you have to do it with all your might all the time. If you do that, you'll be able to achieve that chief aim and then go to your next chief aim. You know, you achieve financial independence so that you could do what you wanted to do more, correct? Correct. Had had you done both of them at the same time, you probably would, first of all, would have taken longer. And second of all, you you realize it when it happens to you, but you don't realize it while you're working your ass off. And the working your ass off is the part that's the important part of the deal. You have to wake up in the morning and be gung-ho to do whatever you need to do that day to get to the next day. Gung-ho. And you can't divert yourself. I, I just tweeted the other day that your phone... <laughs> excuse me... <clears throat> Your phone dings more than it rings. Now, why do I need to know, or why do you need to know that somebody just talked about you on Facebook? Can't you just wait till the end of the day or the end of the week to find that out? Or do you need to go, oh, geez, thanks. Uh, Let me give you a couple of props here. Let me give you whatever. It's just a waste of your time. And it diverts your thought process. When Hill says concentrate, What he says is, get rid of diversions. You don't need to watch television at night to figure out what the weather's going to be. Where you live, it's going to rain. And it's going to rain often. So forget about that. If you go on the M highway system, the roads are full. All the time, both directions. So don't bother with those things. Concentrate on you, what's important to you, and what's going to put you over the top. Focus in on that. And in the process, or the process, provide more service than you're paid for. If you can do that, sincerely, with your heart, not with your head, you're going to win. If you can't do that, you're going to divert yourself to mediocrity. It's plain and simple. What does it look like to provide more service with your heart than your head? I guess we can all understand the head analogy of, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get this amount of money back, and I'm going to buy this ridiculous sports car. Right, you can't measure what you're giving. You just give it. And when you give it freely, then the world pays you back times 10.
But if some guy owes you one because of what you did for them, you know, three months ago, they'll never pay you back. <laughs> and don't, don't worry. And I mean, it's not, surely it's just taking up a load of your, your mind share and your energy when you're, you're trying to negate this as well, right? Exactly. And you're putting yourself in a, in a losing position when you measure it. So providing more service means you've done so much, you can't even remember what the hell you did. And all of a sudden, someone will call, you know, remember a couple of years ago? when you, Yeah. Uh, well, I just got this, and I was wondering if you'd be interested in that. That's how this book was written. Literally. I published for the Napoleon Hill Foundation their weekly newsletter, pro bono, for 15 years. Never asked for a dime. In fact, that was the proposition that I made to them. I said, look, I'll do this on one condition. And they said, what's that? That you never pay me. And it just blew their doors off that someone would go that mile. And sure enough, a decade later, they called me up and said, hey, we found these writings. Would you be interested in annotating them and editing them? I go, yeah, I would. And so I made a deal with the Napoleon Hill franchise or uh, the, their, their foundation because I was a giver, not because I was a measurer and they owed me one and any of that kind of crap. Well, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. You guys really owe me. Like bullshit. But they don't owe me anything. I didn't start it out that way. But sure enough, now my name is on the cover of a book with Napoleon Hill. What else could I ask for? How do Literally. we, Jeffrey, let, let me just pull it back for a second here. Play devil's right. advocate slightly. And, and I can paint a picture for you very clearly of me four years ago when I started the, the podcast, the sales school, all this kind of stuff. I... Uh, High paying medical device sales job, doing well, saved a bit of cash up. Then I lived, moved in with one of my mates to keep my run rate down so I could, that cash would last hopefully a bit longer so I could get a business of some sort off the ground. I knew it was some kind of content business. For you, for, for me to have the conversation now, knowing what I know and knowing that I put out all this free content and you know, eventually it comes back and most of the ad deals that we do, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, because I pride myself on selling them and, and remaining a practitioner of sales as I record this content, most of them come from inbound leads now just because the audience is so big. So it makes selling them very easily. But so so right now, I, I, I agree. Everything you say makes total sense. But four years ago, when I was cold calling individuals because I had no kind of brand, no, a very small audience, and I was asking, you know, I was doing what you were describing of asking a tiny amount of money for more value than, uh, for, and I'm giving more value than the, what the cash equivalent was worth of that. And I was just trying to kind of get things off the ground and get going. It's a very difficult conversation to, to be had there. Now, if you scale this even further out, perhaps there's someone listening who they've got kids, they're, you know, they're, they're tight, ca tight, Come on, cash everybody's tight or whatever got kids. it is. I got kids. <laughs> well, I don't. don't give me that I, I don't, so I can't use that as an example. But you get what I'm saying. How does someone yes. implement all of this? How do they make that mindset shift? when they're, they're, they're tight, they're struggling. You just, and, and you just things answered it. You just answered it. When you started, you worked your ass off. And somehow it bore fruit. And as a result of working your ass off, you now have a, a I'm going to say a bigger ass, but you now have a circumstance where you're, you have what you wanted. You had the goal in mind, wherever you wrote it or did it, the goal was to be financially independent and to have calls coming in to give you money. Well, you don't get there overnight. You get there 20 hours a day. I, I, did you work a nine to five job? Did you, or did you, were you? When I started the podcast. Working 20 I, hours a day. Yeah, I burnt the bridges and, and went full, full into this. Exactly. Because you had the balls to do it. And, you know, the, the, the higher density of brass your balls are, the more likely it is that you'll succeed at it. <laughs> So, so is it reasonable to surmise then that some of this comes down to having faith in yourself that things will work out and, and just getting your head down? Beyond that, having faith in yourself is a prerequisite. Having desire to do that, <laughs> excuse me, having desire to do it, that's another thing. Having the knowledge to do it, that's another thing. Having other people helping you, that's another thing. So it's not one thing. It's a combination of things. And one of the reasons that Truthful Living works is because Hill goes through every single thing you need to do completely and challenges you to get out and do it. And what I've done in the book 
I introduced each chapter because they're 100 years old. And then at the end of the chapter, I said, here's how you can put this into your life. I'm making it as simple as humanly possible. And people are responding to it already. So I know Hill talks about a, a need for a burning desire. What can we do, Jeffrey, if our, <laughs> if our desire is, 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 is wavering, if our desire is embers, embers and needs a good old poking and a good stoking? What can we do to, to raise that, to, to, to really set the house on fire with our level of desire? The people that don't desire or the people that don't have their internal fire lit are people that don't love what they do. And you can't fake that. You know, how do you feel about your podcast? Do you love it? Uh, honestly, I, I enjoy having conversations with people like you. That you know, I've read most of your books over the years. I do love the science podcast that I do. I literally come out of recording uh, conversations with scientists and the, all the random people that we have on that show, literally like bonkers with excitement and joy. Um, not to say that I'm not having a great time with you, Jeffrey, but you know, that's a hobby and this is what pays the bills. So that's the difference between those two in my mind. But the bottom line is if you're looking to succeed beyond your wildest dreams and you don't love what you do, stop doing it because it's not going to get you anywhere. You'll, you'll rise to a level of mediocrity and stay there and be pissed off about it and wonder why <laughs> it's not working. And oh my gosh, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck. No, no, you're, you're fucked up because you don't love what you do. I think it's pretty simple. In that case, then let me ask you this, because this is something I come across all the time with people emailing me, you know, hundreds of emails a day at this point. What percentage of salespeople do you think, I guess, love, because there's multiple elements to this, love selling? And what percentage of salespeople do you think love selling the product that they're specifically selling right now? I'm going to say at least half the salespeople love selling, at least half. I'm also going to say under 25% love what they do. And that's just my own personal number. Um, you know, I I think all poll numbers are bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, if you see 99% of this or 87% of this, I, I don't buy it. So I'm looking at it. This is my gut feeling. And it's having spoken to hundreds of thousands of salespeople influence them. Um, many, many times they... They do what they do because the, the, the living is good. They have a family obligation. They have a mortgage payment or some kind of car payment or whatever it is. And they have to make this money. They would rather do something else, but they have to make this money. And Hill and you are both going to say, no, no, dude. Find what you love to do and jump in. And do it in a way where you can monetize it and have a game plan. That's what Hill says. Don't just have a cheap aim. Have a game plan to go along with it and then have the balls enough to be able to cut the cord. Hmm. I know that's what I had to do. So in for context in my medical device sales role, I loved selling medical devices. It was endoscopy and imaging systems. I'm a huge nerd. And as, <laughs> as anyone knows from the, the sets and all the stuff that we do with the video production side of things, I love all the video elements of it. But my, uh, without calling anyone out, one or two of my sales managers that I had Tried their best to make my life come on, a living call hell. them out the best. Come on, <laughs> I, call them out. I know, I know a couple of them listen to the show. Uh, you know, oh they, they, were, they were nice people, they were just shit at sales management. So, you know, it's, it. it's not for me to kind of uh drag their egos down or anything like that. But I, I, I always found that I was in that, that conflict there. And to resolve the conflict, I looked out there, there wasn't that much content for salespeople from a salesperson, and so that's where the kind of the genesis of the show came from. Um, but with that in mind, Jeffrey, you, here's the deal. Hang on a second. Sure. You genuinely wanted to help people. I wanted you genuinely, to. You genuinely felt that you could impact them. Yeah. And their and their revenue. Well, I knew. Otherwise, I could. you wouldn't. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. But there's a there's also survivor bias to this. Of if the show would have been a complete just flop, no one listened, no one tuned in. There was there was you know it didn't exist four and a half years later. I wouldn't be here having this conversation with you preaching that, uh, and from my respect, I, I have to burn the, burn the bridges, sink the ships, and just go all in on the next thing. That's the only way I can did commit it. to it. You did it, and it worked. Correct, but what I'm saying is- And that should inspire other people that they can do it as well. Here's the deal. Sure. Don't say, if I can do it, you can do it. 
just say, I did it, therefore it can be done. That's it. You don't have to go out and chise and, you know, chastise somebody for not giving up their their weekly income. Rather, you can say, look, use me as an example of what I did and how I did it and figure it out for yourself. It's fair enough. <laughs> when, yeah, when, when you put it it's like totally that, fair it's, it's, it's uh, seamless, right? It's, it's totally fair enough. I My clothes and sales is fair enough. I, it's, the, it's the easiest to learn. Like, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I get everybody in the audience a book. I'm going to customize my talk. I'm going to make sure that everyone walks away feeling like this is the greatest guy that ever talked to us. Is that fair enough? Well, yeah, it's fair enough. <laughs> Great. So all you got to do is send me some money. And the only thing we're questioning now is how much. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like um, I don't want to manipulate the sale. I want to help the other person buy so let's pull this into um, perhaps we, we've covered a couple of the, the the key traits here. Are there any traits that seem counterintuitive or is it all as seamless as we've discussed so far? It is not all seamless. There are some counterintuitive things. You have to divest yourself of things that don't make you money. If you're on this quest, you have to put aside the television. You have to put aside some of the stupid things that you do that waste your time during the course of a day, you could probably have two or three more hours of productivity if you just cut your own crap. It doesn't matter who got beat up in a parking lot. It doesn't matter that the weather's cold and rainy. It doesn't matter that the, that the, the roads are full from, from, you know, whatever traffic jam or whatever time of the day it is. What matters is how you earn a living and what are you doing that's helping other people in the process. Because a lot of that seems like it can be uh, narrowed down to just just taking and, and there's a couple of people who've got books on this at the moment interviewed uh, Jacko Willick on this uh, a few weeks ago but it seems like just taking I think he calls it total responsibility and he's got is that what is that what a lot of this comes down to because I know as a, as a millennial I see a lot of my peers go well you know I'm I'm tired so I get to I'm going to treat myself to watching TV I'm going to I've worked hard in my job this week and so I'm going to treat myself to crappy food or whatever on the weekend, which slows you down and, and ruins your productivity there as well. Listen, you can do those things. Just don't be blaming others for your circumstance. You know, if it wasn't for this, well, I would have this. No, no, dude, you can have whatever you want. You just have to work harder or smarter or both and put yourself in a winning position. And, it, you know, you can, you can measure by yourself. You can measure by others. But the bottom line is you're measuring it by your financial freedom which you've achieved by working your ass off. And I'm sure along the way, you might've had a fish and chips somewhere. <laughs> there's, there's a beautiful Correct? fish and chips place just around the corner. It's a, it's a Friday afternoon is, is a mean mission to not have fish and chips before I go to jujitsu. The only reason I don't have it is because I'm committed to going to jujitsu and I know I'll throw it back up otherwise. I think that the fish and chips industry took a giant leap forward the day they went to newsprint rather than newspaper. <laughs> Because I could read the funnies on my fish sometimes, and it was a little bit depressing. <laughs> right. Let, let me ask you this, and we, we're touching on it here, but how, how? what should be or should there be a work-life balance? And, no. Okay, so what, no. what, so what does that mean then for you know, me you know, in a relationship but no kids, no responsibilities, you know, no mortgage, nothing like that? That for me to say I'm going to spend the next ten years and 32 in a couple of weeks uh, to get my head down. So at 42, I've achieved this, this, and this is is one thing, right? How do we say there's no work-life balance when we've got a partner, kids, responsibilities, the school run, all that kind of stuff? And I'm asking take this for my with, take future. them with you. Find a partner who loves what you do and is willing to work with you. I'm, I'm asking this for my future self, Jeffrey. Is is this a narrative that we need to play out in our minds then of? We're on a journey. We're the hero. We're going to go and slay these dragons. And this is where we're going to be at the end of it. If you're already at financial security, you can partner with whomever you want. If you're not at financial security, you have to partner with someone who's willing to support your thought process, who's willing to back you intellectually and say, come on, bud, you can do it. Encourage you. And Hill talks about that. And what, what kind of people do you surround yourself with? And are they of the same ilk that you are? in order to be able to move forward. 
because you can't do it by yourself. You look at your own success, and I'll guarantee you there are people in the background that help the hell out of you to get from where you are or where you were to where you are now. So on, on the motivation piece then, over the long term, I know Hill talks about uh, sexual transmutation, talks about uh, using music and, and other things to, to motivate us. What's the most effective way then to stay? And I want to dive into the, how do we stay focused in a second? So I think that's probably the most important element to all of this. But how do we stay motivated? Because you know everyone talks about motivating this and motivating that, and everyone has some nonsense Instagram profile with quotes that might get you sprung up in, a, in the moment. But how do we stay motivated towards right. our, our long-term goals over the, over the long term? So the key is to stop thinking motivate and start thinking inspire. Because if I inspire you to do whatever, you're going to do it for a longer period of time than if I simply motivate you for the moment by saying, come on, bud, you can do it. This is not that tough of a thing to do. You're, you're the greatest. I know you can make it happen. Rather, I should give you pieces of information on a daily basis that will actually help you. Things you can think about, things you can become, things you can do. So it's not a matter of motivation. It's a matter of inspiration so that anybody can take that inspiration and use it for themselves over an extended period of time. Think of it as your life's mentor or the person that you aspire to be more like. Not to be, but to be more like. And so everybody has that, that specific person. You already know who it is. The question is, how, how well can you get to know them without saying, can you be my mentor? <laughs> I, I mean, that's just bullshit. Who are um, you inspired to be like Jeffrey, other than clearly Napoleon Hill? Well, yeah, I, I don't know that, I inspire, that I'm inspired to be more like Napoleon Hill, uh, because I, I'm not certain that his background was the same as, as mine is slash was. Um, I'm inspired to be a better person on a daily basis. I, I had a mentor for 35 years who a very wealthy guy, a family guy whose wisdom, for example, if you're not a half an hour early, you're late. Those kinds of things and stories that he had about, uh, where he came from and how he did what he did. Those were inspirational things for me to talk about doing the right thing, being a better person, making sure that you focus in on yourself, but also providing for your family. You know, here's a guy who, in his wealth, paid for everybody's education, whether they wanted to be a college graduate or a lawyer or a doctor. He decided as a grandfather he was going to pay for everybody. And he did. And he said, you know, Jeffrey, a lot of people tell you that you shouldn't spoil your kids and you shouldn't spoil your grandkids. And I tell those people to go fuck themselves because <laughs> I'm going to pretty much do what I want to do. And people adored this guy, not for his money rather for his wisdom and for his inspiration. And I'm friends with many of his grandkids and his kids. They still talk about what he did and what he taught them and how he did it. That's the, that's any unknown guy. You know, it's not like they're, they're following Anthony Robbins into a, uh, you know, into the sunset. I think the less famous a person is, the more likely it is that they will get into your head and you'll, you'll emulate them in what you do. So we'll come on to focus in a second, but you've touched on something here, which I think is probably equally as important, but perhaps you can tell me your thoughts on this, might be harder to change or, or adapt to. And that is seemingly what you're describing there in your mentor, Jeffrey, is he had great values. And obviously that's subjective and it's the values that you relate to, I assume. And so that's why you kind of bonded with him and could learn from him. How do we uncover what our true values are? And I'm sure we could do a whole episode on this on its own. And clearly they're so in-depth, they're, they're, they're ingrained into us. And if we can suss out what they are and we can align our life with them, we're going to be happier and more productive and everything else perhaps will flow from there. So how do we know what they are? Go take a look at your greatest successes and your greatest failures or your setbacks. And I will promise you that you will come up with a list of things for each one that will define your values or what they should have been or what you could have done. And when you look at the great sales that you make, you go, okay, how did I do this? And so I look at my stuff and I go, look, I made millions of dollars worth of sales by using creativity and follow through. Well, wow, I guess those are two things I better focus on. And, and I failed because 
I didn't ask the right questions or I didn't uh, maintain a long term relationship. I, you know, there's things that you do. You know what you did and you know what you didn't do and you know why. And you have to be able to identify those in order to be able to build your package of what you need to do to get to next plateau. And that's what the, that's what truthful living does. It helps you identify your package. Because hmm. I know, I think, I think it was a Tony Robbins book, and I think some of his stuff's a bit wishy washy. But um, whatever the book was, I was reading it, and it something brought brought real light to me, and that was that I had the values of both um, wanting to be secure and then wanting to be free as well. And those took me years to suss out. And what it was was. Uh, if I then I I got this burning desire to become financially free because I knew that if I had enough money coming in to support me, I could go and do ridiculous things, travel, podcast, business, science podcast, all this kind of stuff. But it took me a long time to suss this out. And I, I think the answer to that would be a mentor would be, would have been seeking out someone who I could have, uh, could have just, you perhaps would have jumped on a phone call and go, oh yeah, that, you know, that, that's what you need to aim for, you idiot. And you would have shortcutted the whole, short-circuited the whole process. So clearly mentors are important of all of this. So Jeffrey, in the, to... early, in the, in the early years of my mentorship with this guy, um, I was in the textile screen printing business and he wanted to put money into the business. And my partners were not the most ethical people in the world. And I told, I called this guy up and said, don't invest. He said, what do you mean? I said, don't invest. He said, no, you can have my money. And I said, no, I'd rather have your friendship. And that was the beginning of our relationship. But I sold my business and I started to travel around the country and I'd make 5,000 a week or 10,000 a week for sharing my knowledge with other people. And I'd call him up and brag every time, like, hey, Earl, I did this, hey, Earl, I did that. He said, well, Jeffrey, you make 5,000 here and 10,000 there. Um, you want to make a million? I go, sure. He said, stand still. Oh, like, what could be more plain than that? And I stopped jumping around. I stood still and I'm fine because I did what he inspired me to do, not what he told me to do. And that's the challenge. So this might follow on. Mentors might be part of the solution here, Jeffrey. But in a world where, you know, as we talked about, phones are beeping, buzzing, uh, texts, you know, I, I can hear stuff going on in the background here in the office that um, I'm going to have to put my attention to at some point when we wrap up and uh, kind of uh, uh, close down the show here. In a world where we're just constantly being bombarded and we're forever more going to get bombarded, it's not going to go backwards, I don't think. How do we know what to focus on? And I, I, I love the book, The One Thing. This really helped me uh, kind of narrow down my focus business-wise. But how do we know what to focus on and how do we know what is the... 20% of things to focus on or you know, the, the highest leverage points, which are going to give us the Pareto's law, uh, Pareto principle of 80% of the results. Yeah, I'm not a big Pareto fan, but it's pretty self-evident. But here's the deal. You wake up at five o'clock in the morning and what you do between five and seven and what you do at night between nine and 11, that's going to determine what it is that you really want to do. And you can't be diverted by the shit of the day in order to be able to take away from your power to do what you actually want. So you put up with the shit of the day in order to get to your real desire, your real desired outcome. And you put yourself into the position where you can. But if you're not willing to get up early and you're not willing to stay up late, then you ain't got what it takes anyway. Well, let me ask you this and we'll wrap up with this, Jeffrey. Sure. Deep down... Does everyone have what it takes when they find the correct thing to aim towards? Or, and I may be swayed towards this, are some people just weak? And are some people, maybe it's not the, you, I feel you should take responsibility for your own life and drag yourself out whatever hole you're in. But some people are given a real shitty hand, you know, in, and we won't dive into the examples, but in multiple circumstances, uh, is, is everyone capable of doing incredible things and, and chasing, even if they never reached there, but having a life of, of chasing it and having a fun and passion on the way? Or are some people just destined to be losers? Everyone is capable. Most will not take advantage of their own capability. I think that's the easiest way to put it. <laughs> but let, most let me, people will, let me make it most more people complex, will fall, fall victim to five o'clock at night. It's time for a pint. Yeah. And they'll take the pint 
rather than try to go for the money. They'll spend the money rather than invest their time. And why is this? And from the perspective of 5,000 years ago, if that was your attitude and behavior, you'd be dead in uh, kind of a jungle or something somewhere. You'd be eaten. You'd have, you wouldn't survive. Why is it that, um, other than the obvious of like the UK has an incredible uh, healthcare system in the NHS, which is free for everyone, uh, other than things like that, why is it that people have this mindset now in uh, 2018, as we call this, going into 2019, that it, it's fine to just not chase success and, and to, to be They have an expectation that if they earn enough, they're going to be okay. And uh, I, I don't want to castigate an entire group of people based on an age, but some people are just fucking stupid. <laughs> And and they're never going to get it, no matter what group they're in. Sure. So you look at it from the perspective of, I want what I want. You want what you want. You're willing to work hard to get it. Most people aren't willing to work hard. Mm. Most people will take the diverted way. Interesting. Well, we'll wrap it up with that, Jeffrey. And I've got one final question, mate, that I ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time, sir, to speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Stop wasting time on things that don't matter in the long run. Devote more time to your family. Devote more time to your friends. Devote more time to reading and learning. And stop worrying about something stupid that in the end won't matter. If I want to know the news these days, I can find it out in five seconds. And then in 10 seconds, I'm done. So we've, we're afforded the luxury today of knowing everything you need to know in a minute. Then the question is, what do you do with the other 59? So that every hour is devoted to what you're hoping to achieve for the long term. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter. I have her every other week. There is not a day that goes by that I don't walk her to school. We park away from the car line and we walk to the school and the same, I pick her up at the end and we walk back to the car because I want to spend a couple of minutes talking to her about how the day was and what did she do that was important. So you can't tell me that you're not willing to invest family time. It's not a matter of balance. It's a matter of time invested and time allocation. So even if it's only 10 minutes a day, my daughter feels like queen because I'm asking her about her or I'm challenging her about what she's thinking about or where they played or what the movie she's going to want to watch is. So I look at it as quality, not quantity. And when you're talking about work-life balance, uh, people equate that to well, if I spent two hours doing this, I need to spend two hours doing that. You don't. You need to spend 99 hours making yourself successful. And the other hundredth hour is making other people feel great about themselves and feel grateful for you. The best way, and I love that, Jeffrey, I appreciate the uh, the kind of personal anecdote there. And just to wrap things up, the best way that I've ever heard work-life balance being described is you're swimming in the, the tropics and there's two islands. There's you know, perhaps work and life, or it could be work and you're winning that golf tournament, whatever it is. It, when you go, well, I'm going to do an hour of this, then I'm going to be, need to be home at five and I'll focus on this and I'll go back and forth. You end up just swimming between them. You're just zigzagging. You're not going anywhere. And again, for me, financial freedom was, um, and you know, I'm not freaking balling. I'm still working my ass off here. <laughs> I don't want to kind of make things to, to be, to, to I'm, I'm not driving a Ferrari just yet kind of thing. But the get into that get into that stage going all into that island it's just been four years of just hammering it home right now and probably another what's wrong with that no no what's nothing wrong with nothing that? i think it's okay I think so it's amazing here's because, the deal let me just finish this Let's... anecdote jeffrey because oh, once you get to one side then you've got a straight simple path to the other and then again you can spend you know, time with your family do whatever is your hobbies and you can keep going back and forth but until, if, if you don't commit to one or the other which i think sums up some of the conversation we've had so far here you're not getting anywhere are you Correct. Um, I can give you a, a more interesting way to look at it for the moment. Go to the island where it's hard work. And at the end of your hard work, you can buy the other island. <laughs> yes. And build a, and build a bridge. 
<laughs> build a motorway across. Love it. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's the perfect analogy. If you want to get great at tennis, well, crush it with business, sales, whatever it is, and hire the best freaking tennis coach, right? On the planet. Live with them. Yeah. Well, they Travel come, the they come with live them. with you. Amazing. Exactly. Uh, whatever it takes to do, you do. And it's, but have a game plan. You can't just do it willy nilly. You have to have a set of in personal instructions that you're willing to follow and dedicate your time to allocate your time to and make it happen for yourself in a way that you're pleased by it. Mm. And I guess that's the challenge. That's the, uh, the to, to be pleased along the journey is probably a conversation for another time. With that, Jeffrey, tell us a little bit more about Truthful Living, where we can find it, and then where we can find out more about you as well, sir. Dude, Truthful Living, you go to fucking Amazon.com and you look up Truthful Living and you click the buy now button. And in two days, if you're a prime member, it shows up at your doorstep. That's the incredibleness of Amazon. They are by far setting a standard for business that no one will be able to jump onto for a decade at least. You know, there's people that kind of claw, well, we're going to do this. They're not. <coughs> Amazon is in the business of cleaning other people's clocks. And they're doing it. And they're doing it with service. They're doing it with delivery. They're doing it with consistency. And they're, they're willing to go out there and put whatever it is that they're selling on the line with ratings. You can rate anything. So before you buy anything, whether it's a, a pair of socks or a book, you look to see what, how many stars they have. Everyone does it now. They have changed the game. And they've done it in a way where Look at your example. You know, what What are you doing? What are your listeners doing that's putting themselves at the head of their field by offering services that other people don't offer? That's just it. Be the service provider. Be the, be the amazing provider that will put a back order in a taxi cab and, and, and make it happen. And just by the way, when I get into a taxi cab in London, I take the black cab because I, I just want those guys. <laughs> and when the guy says, where to governor, I'm just absolutely enthralled. Where to governor? I'm like, cool. Do you know, where, know. Do you know where, Jeffrey, the best taxis in the world are? No. Dublin, Ireland. Oh, wow. I went on, so I've got family over in, in, in Southern Ireland, so we go there quite regularly. Dublin Island taxis, I don't know whether it's the exams they have to do. I don't know whether it's just the personality that they bring. I don't know because the roads are just mad, but most mo cities' uh, roads are mad, so I'm not sure about that. They are so knowledgeable. They are so friendly. They are Irish. They're cheery. I don't know if they're half pissed on Guinness as they're driving around, whatever it is, whether they get an allowance from the Guinness factory around the corner. The best taxi drivers on the planet. Cool. They love what they do, and you tip them bigger. For sure. For sure. With that, mate, I want to thank you for your time, your insights. You, your little bit, your little red book of selling was the second sales book that I ever read. Uh, it was gifted to me by a sales director many years ago. So I appreciate that, Jeffrey, and the insights that you've been giving me over the well, uh, freaking decades now, which is uh, sad to say. And with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time and joining us on the show. It's a pleasure. It's a total pleasure. 